a very special edition of the Hyperledger Technical Steering Committee. Everybody is welcome at this meeting, and likewise, everybody is welcome at all of our working group meetings, and everybody is especially welcome to contribute code to our projects under Apache 2 license. If you are uncertain how to behave in any of these settings, we do have a code of conduct, which you can go take a look at, which I can summarize for you very briefly as be respectful of those around you. Uh, we do have a very full agenda this morning, so I'm going to pretty much jump right into things. You can read the event reminders yourself. Um, do we have on the call a representative from the Caliper project? Victor, perhaps? Okay, so we'll keep that in mind. Um, if we don't hear from uh, the Caliper project, uh, as we're getting going this morning, we might go ahead and use up that time slot to extend the supply chain proposal if we need to. Hello, hello. Oh, hello. great. Uh, Hi. I'm, I'm the Caliper maintainer. Wonderful. All right. Well, we will come around to your agenda item in about uh, half an hour, probably. And then uh, do we have somebody from Fabric as well? Yeah, so Chris was planning to give the update. I don't know if we have Dave. Otherwise, I could give it if needed, I suppose. Okay. But uh, otherwise, Chris said he was not going to be able to join before the half hour. So I was wondering if you could actually move the supply chain discussion to later in the agenda. Maybe we can start with the reports. That's what I was going to suggest as well, because otherwise, if we could start on the supply chain stuff, we're likely to not get to the updates. And exactly, I think time-wise, mm -hmm. it might be easier to manage. Yeah, I did think of that. We had some availability, though, from uh, constraints from a few of the participants, including the uh, supply chain proposal. Um, so my hope is that we can, uh, can either, either way, we're going to have to to cut off some of the discussion. So I hope that we can contain the discussion effectively. And then uh, from the Sawtooth project, I believe we'll have uh, Andy available. Yep, I'm here. Wonderful. Hey, it's okay. Chris. Sorry, I'm late. Oh, great. So well, you made Chris it. is here okay. nonetheless. Um, all right, so with that, uh, I would like to introduce Dave Checky, who's a director of data engineering for Cargill. It's one of the uh, co-sponsors of the supply chain proposal uh, to walk us through the proposal and, and talk about it. Hey, Dan, before, yeah. before that starts, um, how would people feel about setting a time limit on how long we discuss supply chain today? Um, and if we need to, we'll continue the discussion another time just so we can get to the other updates and things that need to happen. Yeah, thanks, Mark. I was planning on allocating about a half an hour for the supply chain discussion and then uh, 10 minutes each for each of the uh, scheduled updates. Does that work for everyone? Works for me. Sounds good. All right, great. Uh, Dave, check are you on the line? Yes, I am. Can you hear me okay? I sure can. Great. Always an achievement when the AV works. <laughs> Definitely is. Okay, well, uh, is, I, we just start. I'm not familiar with protocol and how these we, we transition here, but. Uh, yeah, so in the uh, chat session for uh, chat.hyperledger.org under the TSC channel, I have just pasted the link for the proposal, but that is also in the uh, meeting agenda that was sent out to the TSC list. Yeah. Uh, and so you're free to. Uh, proceed as you like. You can either share your screen or just uh, ask people to guide through the, the proposal themselves. Yeah, and so like, I don't know that I need to share a screen, uh, but I'll, I'll have it up here and people can move, people can move, uh, move through it. Uh, so thank you for the opportunity. It's a privilege to get to present a proposal like this to this, uh, to this group. Uh, and uh, it sounds like there's a healthy level of interest in discussing this topic and that's candidly very exciting to see. Uh, uh, I, I, I come from Cargill. I work at Cargill. Uh, we're a large agribusiness company. We often say we're the biggest company no one's ever heard of, uh, but that's okay. Uh, and we've been exploring and are very excited about 
uh, open source blockchain solutions and where they will apply to our uh, various business processes, industries, and markets. Uh, we started on this maybe 18 months or two years ago uh, and have been working with like-minded partners to, uh, again, explore, prototype, and pilot some use cases uh, based on Hyperledger, among other things, but primarily on Hyperledger solutions. Uh, as we've as we've started to build out these solutions, like our approach has been like let's build reusable frameworks, reusable building blocks that we could then assemble uh, into solutions to to provide uh, velocity, quality, and really all the other reasons uh, that someone would build uh, reusable frameworks. And uh, it has honestly surprised surprised us as we as we started to move into this, and maybe it shouldn't have been just based on broad maturity of the solutions in general, but uh, it surprised us about the lack of uh, structure or the lack of available frameworks that existed in the open source community. Uh, for example, like even things like primitive data types uh, weren't, weren't well defined uh, and available to just include as part of a project. Every single project that wants to start in the open source community has to like define what data types they support. Uh, and as and as engineers, I'm sure we all can look at that and say, feels like we should have a little bit more available for reuse. Uh, in addition to that, we've seen most of our personal use cases have anchored around supply chain uh, and various supply chain type applications. And so these reusable frameworks or or building blocks. Uh, really are uh, we see being used across uh, different apps or different types of solutions. Uh, and as we're building those out uh, and working with others to, to think about how those should work, uh, it, became, uh, it became a conversation about like, where should we put these? Uh, and as, <clears throat> as, as most of our foundational blockchain stuff, at least, is, is done with Hyperledger, uh, we, uh, our direction became, why wouldn't we consider just giving these back to the Hyperledger community uh, for the purposes of uh, supply chain use cases. Uh, and so that, that's really the, the background for this proposal. And so really what this would consist of is uh, a set of components, frameworks, models, what have you, that help people build higher quality solutions, applications, products, or what have you, uh, with hyperledger tools so this is not a this is not an application in and of itself you would not download run install and run uh the hyperledger supply chain or whatever it ends up being called you would you would use that to build your own products uh, we really see this as uh as exciting for a lot of reasons uh i think it, like personally again i think as i as an observer uh, of how Hyperledger works, like it feels like it's it's on a fragmented path in some respects, and like how can how can this type of project help unify thinking uh, for enterprise blockchain use cases uh, when it comes to the things like uh, WASM, for example, uh, when it comes to things like identity, when it comes to things like uh, uh, other maybe more uh, specific in, uh, not industry, I don't want to say industry, but more specific reusable uh, standards and, and frameworks. And so hopefully we can enable some of that as well. The, uh, so that's effectively kind of what we're proposing. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how, how else or like where else we would talk through this. Like, does it go to Q&A now or does it go to comments or, or what? But I mean, fundamentally, I, I want to be clear that like, it feels like there's a gap in the open source community around providing reusable frameworks and tools to enable applications to be built efficiently and with quality. And, and like every, every software product out there has, the, has libraries and has modules. And how, how, do we, how is Hyperledger thinking about that? Because like Cargill's ready to, com, com, to invest and to commit to providing these capabilities to the community and being part of the community. And, and, and so where does that stuff go? All right, well, thanks, Dave. And, and yeah, so uh, I guess with that as some further background to the proposal that's been circulated, we'll open it now to Q&A uh, with an emphasis on uh, 
clarifying questions around the proposal and and once those are satisfied we can get into a bit of broader discussion about uh, the scope for our technical community is this we lost audio here did, did you guys that then we lost you okay yeah, sorry um I'm trying to uh, speak in a very crowded area, so I kept keep uh, putting myself on mute so that, anyway, uh, um, I really support this because I think uh, it's time we started talking about building solutions rather than, uh, you know, getting in the weeds of the uh, DLT itself. Uh, and that's very important. And, uh, I was wondering whether that about two things. One is whether the um, proposal follows the template that we have proposed, that we have in the, um, you know, we have in our documents a template for a project proposal. The second is, could there be more details on what exactly are the generic components that you're building? You mentioned two, WASM and uh, and uh, identity, but uh, I, I believe there are. Uh, you know, in supply chain use cases, uh, that there are some primitives that would help other use cases as well. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, like uh, we started developing the privacy and confidentiality working group on, our, on the architecture with the supply chain use case for factoring, uh, you know, invoice factoring. And I know that some of the uh, uh, production systems that are out there, um, like Monatago's uh, system in India is based on invoice factoring. So there are these components that uh, take finance, provenance, various other, uh, other types of uh, interactions that are part of the supply chain use case. So were you thinking of uh, uh, concentrating on uh, certain sections of it or are you, uh, interested in the whole value chain and the primitives surrounding them yeah and so i mean certainly it's a really it's a really thoughtful question and i, I want to be clear that like the, the motivations for cargill submitting mm -hmm. this are supply chain centric absolutely like i can envision that components from this type of supply chain uh type framework or frameworks may have applicability to other market models. Like to me, that's somebody else, like the finance thinks that there's also uh, use for uh, permission schemes that are similar to how permission schemes operate in supply chains. That is awesome. Let's, let's, uh, let's convene and talk about how to refactor and reuse in, in appropriate ways. But so I'm not attempting to overreach, you know, into like finance domains. So there's another part of there's another part of Vipin's question, which is um, supply chain. Uh, supply chain is a really, really general term, sure, um, and it encompasses yeah. a huge amount of stuff from um, tracking and logistics, um, uh, planning, uh, querying, all the way to the invoicing and managing of of um, uh, the financial side of it. Um, how are you constraining maybe maybe a better question is when you talk about finance or supply chain what is your definition of it and do you have a specific set of capabilities because i didn't see that listed in the paper it was, it's a very very general description and i have a hard time figuring out exactly what it is you would build yeah i think yeah. that's fair and i think uh i think if we look at initial supply chain use cases which are uh certainly broad in scope, although I would argue that like the financial, like no one, like supply chain does not consist of AR and AP and some of the things that you talked about there are uh, potentially bridging into other parts of the business domain. Uh, but we are looking, and the proposal does speak to this somewhat, but I mean, typical use cases that we see uh, do have to do with logistics, do have to do with uh, track and trace type scenarios, uh, and do have to do with uh, really what are, what we see as multi-party distributed supply chain, uh, business process enablement. 
and and I, like all of these things are underpinned by certain constructs that are very similar like there's software that does this stuff and has for decades and so it's not it's not new concepts uh, we don't right now intend to like prioritize demand forecasting or detailed scheduling in our production facilities but that's also part of supply chain in the broad umbrella like what we're looking for is to solve distributed supply chain problems and just saying hey as we as we develop maybe an opinionated data model for something like product and we and we enable products to be stored on hyperledger we we're happy to give that back and like candidly i'm a little surprised it doesn't exist already like why isn't there something like all these consortiums that are getting together like they all ask the same question how should we store products and like having an initial opinion from hyper as uh, on hyperledger that doesn't mean you have to take it but but like where should we put it all right this is all right. to me like that like that stuff is like just the building blocks the fundamental building blocks for like a location or a product or or a, or a, a party uh, those type of things like all that right. all feels very reasonable and those can enable a lot of different use cases like we talked about right. uh, my name yeah right. so, my name is george pulser um you, you um you made a point uh, saying you're surprised that there aren't already uh, these uh, products or tools out there. Uh, my research shows that there are blockchain based supply chain uh, vertical solutions uh, uh, on the market. Uh, yeah, I'm talking in the open source community, in particular Hyperledger, just to be clear. Like I know there are commercial products that solve this, uh, but like we're, we're proposing bringing this back to the open source community. Uh, I, I have a suggestion. Uh, sorry, it's uh, uh, Thomas from MIT. So, so a couple of things. Uh, so, yes, supply chain is uh, very general, but I'm seeing multiple use cases that talk about supply chain. Everything from signed, you know, firmware for chipsets, you know, in the DoD space, you know, all the way to to the music guys, you know, doing open music. Uh, would it be useful if Hyperledger could define uh, a transaction format that's generic enough that could be used in any of these <clears throat> environments? Because I got to believe they have, you know, all of these have commonalities, right? This, you know, is it is it a format that has the sender and receiver addresses with a bunch of, you know, back pointers links? You know, what is it? Right. And, and I think, you know, it would be awesome to have this because it saves so much time. Yeah. And that, that actually is the fundamental intent here. And, and I want to emphasize that like those problems like have been thought about and worked on and in many ways solved outside of blockchain. And so this is a matter of like bringing, you know, businesses have been transacting <laughs> digitally for a while and like for data formats have been agreed to. <laughs> Now maybe there's opportunities to refine that, but like, how do we how do we just enable those types of use cases? So this Hi, this is, is, uh, just to get back to, to addressing the next question a little bit about the project. So there are are, are a couple things that that kind of constrain that that scope. Uh, I think pretty naturally. Um, one is you know that that. Uh, the, the things that we're, we're putting in are in some way uh, blockchain related, uh, which constrains uh, uh, the, the types of things that, that we would put into the project. Um, the, the other is that we're really looking for reusable components. And, and so as we, as we get to um, into, into really specific use cases, um, there, there may or may not be patterns there that, that, that are interesting to implement uh, so they can be reusable. Um, and then the, the third is that, that as, a, as a platform, the components all have to work together, which will naturally, uh, I think, um, drain uh, the types of, of things that, that go into it. Um, hi, this is, this is Silas. Um, so I'm, I may be also having a bit of a hard time with the, the potential breadth of supply chain as an umbrella. Um, so so a, a couple of points on that. I wonder what, what code currently exists. Are there any concretions that you can describe 
that might give a bit of color to this and, and what if this was uh, put into in incubation what what would land on day zero if anything um, and then another remark is uh, a, a lot of this seems to be uh, perhaps centered around business process are we sure that the idea of the supply chain as the as an umbrella project is what we want here are there smaller projects that we could see the shape of first now if you're talking about standardizing around transactions or the nouns of things or if you're talking about standardizing uh, running like business process models on a chain um do we need to go in with supply chain to start with yeah i mean if, if it's a semantic question about the name I, like we can talk about that but to get to the concretions like the nouns in particular and we spoke to this a little bit earlier but uh, you know, things like customer or things like, like counterparty or, or party somehow, some sort of construct like that, uh, <coughs> constructs like product or material uh, that, that might be used. Process, true process enablement and business rules, uh, to me, feel like an application, right? We're talking, about, we're talking about reusable components that can be assembled into an, uh, into a, into an application. And the specific <coughs> business logic would be implemented at an app layer that would tie these these primitives together in ways that you know you, business, business business process modeling is not an app level thing you know if you look at a standard like bpmn that's kind of what i had in mind yeah well, sure yeah i mean uh, I help me understand though why why wouldn't existing standards for supply chain apply i type you know i i mean th there are a number of industry right. standards that are already existent they're implemented in most of the supply chain solution space that we have today why would why wouldn't we just why, why wouldn't a supply chain solution just reuse those things um, i mean it's not like people are coming along and doing another iso you know 2020 or 2022 they're not they're just using well, that can i can i throw out an example uh, i'm working with a company that does raw uh, raw material aggregation uh, to uh, uh, to enhance the ability to negotiate with the suppliers uh, it, it, multiple tiers down. So there are very siloed solutions and this particular company does not have blockchain yet, but they're interested in taking a look to see how it could apply when you're trying to get the, your suppliers to purchase from the same, uh, uh, the, the, that material, raw material from the same supplier. Uh, so there are very specific supply chain vendors siloed that can be looked at to see if they are willing to work in an open source environment to blockchain enable their solution. Right, but, but and, and I don't know if that was a, like, so honestly, the ISO comment, if that was supportive or uh, objecting to the proposal, but uh, like the proposal absolutely to me is like, oh, yes, these standards exist. Why aren't they implemented in open source and available in Hyperledger already? So if you want to use like existing, like we all align, like at Cargill, we align with industry standard data models. And why isn't there just a Hyperledger implementation of a GTIN backed product or an EAC backed product, product that we can plug into with a smart contract that allows me to push and pull those off of blockchain? Like if we build it, why can't we contribute it? Like, because we're gonna, it's just a matter of like, like where does it go? So, so just, just to clarify, is there any existing code right now? Uh, yeah, sure, there's some code. And I think like we started to, I mean, it's internal in a lot of cases and we've been debating about where to upstream it. And, uh, but like, it's not production ready, but I think this is a proposal for an incubation. Although we do run some of it. Oh yeah. Well, just to, to yeah, expand that, that, on that. Fair enough. Enough. Yeah, there's also existing code that I linked in the proposal uh, that came from uh, uh, track and trace usage. So there's uh, stuff about uh, uh, telemetry and so forth that's already built. Uh, but I, I know I'm definitely interested in facilitating Cargill's contributions to expand on that existing code. I want to make a, a few comments. This is Mohan with Chainyard. So, you know, one of it is like we have been also trying to do something similar, but for our own projects. So we've been doing supply chain projects in manufacturing, retail, uh, supplier collaborations. And, but we noticed that in each one of these scenarios, the, you know, even within the same scenario, the object that we designed does not map to a new organization that joins the network or wants to join the network. So we've, we have been trying to see 
what is that bare minimum set of uh, attributes that can be reused? And we've been progressing in that space. Now, coming back to Chris's comments, you know, there are like standards like Rosetta Net, uh, EBXML, uh, you know, EDI standards and supply chain. Uh, one of the things that I notice is that, uh, you know, the, the blockchain is yet another addition for the purpose of trust. And it, it's in many cases, you know, I notice that uh, solution developers are using it as though it's a transactional system. We actually have been seeing it as more as a system of trust. Where, you know, in the past, it used to be MDM, uh, master data management, uh, but uh, master data management has been very siloed. So the blockchain could serve as a trusted MDM. So that's the direction we've been progressing in most of the projects, but I'm happy to discuss with you all whenever you have sessions on this and if this proposal really moves forward. I'm done, so. Thank you for that. <laughs> so I had a question that I asked in the chat. Um, can, can you all compare the, so, so the, most, the most direct comparison that we have in existing projects is probably Composer. Can you all compare the, the scope of this project with sort of Composer? Um, yeah, I can maybe get us started because I might be uh, more familiar with Composer than, than Dave would be. But yeah, I, would, I think of Composer as, as a tool that was meant to help people get ramped into blockchain and then do code generation on their behalf uh, and letting them uh, try to turn their ideas about what the business processes were or the uh, business considerations into blockchain code. I think some of what we want to do with with this supply chain project is to not necessarily do code generation in the way that Composer would have, but to still facilitate uh, encoding those uh, more business level concerns that you would eventually want to do in delivering an application. Would it be possible for you guys to maybe add a little bit about this in your project proposal? Because this really wasn't clear for me when I read the proposal. Yeah, Dave, have I misconstrued that at all? No, I don't think so. And we can revisit the proposal. I mean, if, that, if that's the process as we refine the proposal, like happy. Yeah, typically we'll, yeah, typically we get feedback uh, in these meetings and then uh, there's usually some suggested edits and we can refine the proposal to add clarifications or, or otherwise. The, the one most important thing I'd like to see would be a non-generic name for the project. I think uh, it's very important to give it a cutesy, um, bizarre, and completely unmarketable name. Um, uh, <laughs> that uh, There's no risk of either people confusing this as the only supply chain project uh, that would ever be hosted at Hyperledger, nor as uh, the official one or, you know, that sort of thing. Of course, yeah. We know that the the name of the baby process is is fun, but also time consuming. So, <laughs> put a bunch of names in the hat and pull it out. And yeah, and to be clear, like we we're just trying to get like the, we didn't Cargill did not have an expectation <clears throat> around naming. Uh, one one thing that would be interesting uh, to me w would be uh, to have some references to the to these existing standards and references that you might see this as an implementation of, um, or, or implementing parts of, uh, just for my own understanding and, and perhaps as a way to further constrain the project. And that might provide a, a nice way of also sort of sequencing what the expectations are for deliverables. Sure. And that makes sense. I, I, I do think there's a notion of, uh, and I think this is maybe a, a circular conversation and I, I want to respect the time boxing, but different, different types of supply chains might have different types of industry models that are relevant and like, where would those be housed is maybe an interesting question for this group as this thinking evolves. So for example, in, in the food and ag space, there are, there are existing data standards around things like traceability uh, and uh, importing and exporting of uh, uh, commodities uh, across borders. And, and like those are the existing data models and, and, and consensus driven or consortium driven standards. 
And so like we can enumerate a bunch of those here, but that is by no means exhaustive. And some like the some semiconductor supply chain might use some other standard that like Cargill has no insight into. And that this shouldn't necessarily constrain this project to implementing only a uh, certain list of standards, if that makes sense. Yeah, this is this is James Mitchell. I, I think it's really hard to draw a box around that feature list. I think it's much easier to rally around a guiding principle for um, what makes sense as a reusable component. Um, and you know, the, the governing principle there is um, you know, general common reusability abstraction, things that are going to be broadly applicable to uh, a number of different application developers. Um, and so as Dave mentioned, right, the, the, the intent here is this could be a rallying point for lots of different contributors um, to a common open source implementation of some of these concepts. Um, so when we talk about things like product and, and like maybe the mutation of that product so that goes through a manufacturing process, um, you know, those feel like really fundamental concepts. Uh, and it really would be a shame, A, if there weren't an open source solution uh, for, for that, that, um, that, that concept, and B, if everyone went and built their own uh, in silos. And so it, it really feels to me, you know, very much the promise of, um, you know, kind of hyperledger to say, let's, let's create a place where the community can come together and, uh, and help collaborate on some of these solutions that can benefit everybody. So do we see if this became a project, do we see it being limited to this specific vertical or would it encompass, you know, the different verticals as you mentioned, I guess? Yeah, I feel like those, those are governance questions that would have to be addressed by the Hyperledger group as things evolve and mature. Well, I, I guess I would say that there isn't a specific vertical called out here. So uh, Cargill definitely has probably their own vertical interests um, and, and so on and so forth. But I, I don't think that this, well, I know that this proposal isn't specifically around uh, food or silicon or uh, any, any uh, individual industry specific concern. I'm very confused. There isn't it. You sort of said both in the same paragraph there. Uh, I'm not quite sure I, I understood the question. Well, this is, this is one of the things that's interesting to me is it seems like there is kind of a generic um, tokenization of assets in a privacy or confidentiality preserving way that's very blockchain centric and important, not as a specific vertical. Um, that this project seems to touch on, but we're trying to figure out which part of it is kind of the in support of a SIG for supply chain versus which part is kind of the generic tools construct. Yeah, I think generic to tools is maybe an interesting word. It's really, we see it as more a component or implementation of a, of a, of a shared resource, like a shared library. Uh, so like product is a really good example of that, right? So like if we, if, if ever, uh, effectively every use case that we've explored, we end up trying to define how we're going to store uh, a product that's moving through the supply chain or transform a product as it moves through the supply chain. And so internally, we've built out concretions, was the word someone used, but let's say implementations of how to, how to get a, a product on and off of a hyperledger solution. And so like bringing that framework to Hyperledger and contributing it back to open source to say, this is the spec compliant implementation of this of product. If you want to conform to this ISO model or this other uh, agreed upon standard, we've implemented it. Like having the community do that feels, feels very natural to me. Right. And so like, we're like, that would be part of this, this month. Now that doesn't solve, a, that doesn't implement a business process. That doesn't solve an application. An, 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 that doesn't enable an industry model. It provides a building block or a component that someone could use to go do that. Right, but that's a very yeah, I, 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 that's a very specific thing, and I don't think. I mean, and in fact, I think there's actually some things going on in the labs that are sort of along those lines, where somebody says, "Here's an interesting thing. You know, we've developed it. It's based on this, and you're free to use it, and that's a wonderful thing." It's a very different thing to try and establish something as a top level project here and not have it get into specific solution domain. Um, 
in 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 this particular context. At least I I don't I don't see how that works out, right? I mean, and I'll just say like as a, as a participant, that really feels like semantics. And so like where this group or where the the governing board like sees where the proper semantic place for these reusable components is like totally I can defer to that. Mm -hmm. But I mean that that just feels like we're like when you say like that feels like a top level prior not a top like whatever man like where does the library go that we're gonna like all share? Well, well, I, and and just just to be clear, I think you know again you know we invest in marketing and so forth around our top level projects, um, and and we give them a lot of focus and a lot of support from infrastructure and so forth, um, and and it's you know it's it's different than. Um, people who just want to share something under an open source license that's consistent with everything else we're doing here um, and and not looking for, you know, uh, you know, so the the added. Yeah. Um, so, sorry to, to cut in. We'll give you more or less the, the last word on that, uh, Chris, or, or we will have uh, and we'll have to cut over now to the caliper uh, update. Uh, so I appreciate uh, Dave making time to join us here. Uh, new contributor uh, into this meeting uh, and we can follow additional conversation in chat and the mail list. Um, switching rather abruptly uh, to Caliper, do we have uh, the presenter still available there? Hi Dan, this is Victor. Hi Victor, uh, thanks for really joining us again. Yeah. <laughs> Because we, uh, I didn't have the chance for from last meeting, so I will always be here waiting. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I'm sorry again we weren't able to uh, manage our time better last week. Uh, but but uh, please feel free to jump into it. I've pasted the link to your update into the TSC channel in the in the uh, chat at hyperledger.org. So uh, do you need to open the link? Um, I'm not sharing my screen. Uh, we'll trust for people to follow along on their own screens. Uh, you're welcome to share your screen if you wanted to guide us through it. Uh, otherwise, we'll just uh, uh, let you speak to it while we look at it ourselves. Uh, I've sent the, uh, the update link in the chat box. So everyone can look into it uh, when I'm introducing. So uh, first, uh, uh, for Project Health, uh, actually, uh, we uh, the Caliper project has met some uh, problems uh, in last quarter. For well, we lost uh, two major developers because they shifted their uh, work. So uh, the project has been silent for some time. And we have some pending peers and uh, unanswered questions. And uh, I think uh, at the Montreal meeting, uh, I have talked with uh, many community experts and uh, they really gave me a lot of good, good advices. So uh, in this uh, two weeks, uh, Caliper team has uh, uh, took uh, multiple means to improve the project health and uh, we have reviewed and uh, merged uh, uh, and closed uh, most uh, of the pending PRs. Uh, we only left uh, several uh, PRs still under development uh, unclosed. And uh, we need some time to recover, so we introduced uh, new contributors and uh, maintainers. And uh, we started uh, having online meetings and to discuss and uh, we should uh, make some uh, rules for the project uh, development uh, to be more formal and uh, complete uh, some uh, missing, uh, missing things in our previous development uh, procedures. So uh, I think uh, the project is recovering and uh, it will become active again. So for issues, uh, I have talked uh, a lot about uh, issues, so there is no, no new issues at this time. And the releases, uh, Caliper is still on the development, uh, so 
uh, everybody works on master branch no, no release yet and uh, though the project has been silent for some time we still did a lot of work uh, in the past quarter because we have a uh, active user uh, using Caliper and uh, they're pushing us to implement a lot of uh, features. So, uh, so there are some features like uh, Caliper uh, robustness has been greatly improved and uh, during our long time running test uh, we found some uh, memory leak and uh, uh, other uh, issues, so they are all fixed, uh, and uh, now Caliper can run up to 24 hours and more. And uh, we added a lightweighted uh, development network, and uh, added an event uh, subscription, uh, subscription approach uh, for SOTUS, and uh, thanks persistent assistance, and uh, Caliper uh, client has been split, split into two, one for sending transactions and one to listen for the events. Uh, in the past, it was done by one single client. And um, there are two uh, features has been implemented, uh, but it's not uploaded uh, uh, or upstreamed to Caliper yet. Uh, one is uh, using C++ to uh, rewrite the 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 transaction sending proce process, and uh, which greatly improves transaction sending rates uh, for one single client. Though in the past we have uh, distributed uh, clients to use multiple clients to sending uh, transactions, but uh, this is uh, focused to enhance the single client and. Uh, we added, uh, oh, we enhanced the resource monitor. In the past, we use uh, a process uh, or Docker resource monitor. And uh, this time uh, we integrated uh, a standalone resource mon monitoring tool, Grafana. And uh, it provides uh, better um, uh, UI and uh, collects more uh, metrics. So that's great. Uh, one question I see for you, Victor, on on chat from Hart is: What is the current level of communication between Caliper and the Performance and Scale Working Group? Uh, well, uh, I think uh, we also made a plan that uh, uh, for at least uh, for every performance and uh, working uh, and scalability working group meeting, at least uh, one representatives from Caliper team will be there. That's great to hear. Um, and then uh, I'll ask to you to uh, go ahead and, and coordinate with Mark Wagner to make sure that the, the time zones for that are uh, as manageable as possible for, for all the participants. Yeah, we've had uh, Attila from Budapest has been joining the call in the last couple calls. Uh, he's on Caliper. He's one of the Caliper maintainers now. Great. All right. Um, if there's further questions or uh, comments, I'll ask you to take those again to uh, chat or the mail list. And we will switch over at this point to the fabric update. Uh, and Chris mentioned that he is ready to prepare that. And I'll go ahead and drop that link into the uh, Hyperledger chat. Thanks again, Victor. No problem. My pleasure. Thanks, Dan. So um, Dan's pasting the link in, I guess, into the TSC chat. Um, uh, so in terms of um, the Fabric update, we continue to, I think, to grow and mature. Um, we're, we, we just delivered last week our 1.3 release. Um, a little bit late, but there was this small matter of a hurricane. <laughs> and uh, that whacked North Carolina pretty heavily and that's where most of the sort of the system level testing was was being done and so we had to um, we had to push that off a little bit um, but we're on track I think for 1.4 release um, 
uh, the the just sort of the TLDR version of this is that we did increase the percentage of uh, the, the, the ratio, I should say, of you know IBMers versus non IBMers. Um, it bumped up about six percent. Again, it's not that many individuals. Um, we didn't actually lose non IBMers. We actually gained a couple of um, IBMers in the in the mix. So there's a bit of transition going on with some people moving around, but um, uh, I think, uh, you know, we, we also got some pretty good feedback at the member summit and at the Hackfest about some things we can do to try and, and uh, you know, continue to increase the diversity of the project. Um, we continue to see a, a, a good mix of questions on, you know, email and chat, and Stack Overflow, um, you know, that continues to rage. And there's a, there's a good population of people that are helping to answer a lot of these questions, which is a, a good thing. Um, uh, we, again, at, you know, at the member sub, we had a lot of discussion around, you know, uh, issues that sort of inhibit new people from coming on board. Um, the, the, the one theme that seemed to really stand out was the, 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 the <laughs> you know, the, the plethora of chat channels that we have certainly for fabric and it's sometimes daunting for people to figure out where, where they should answer, ask a question or, Maybe they'll ask a question, but you know, then it's a little bit of cricket sometimes, depending on when they ask it or, you know, whether anybody was paying attention because there's so much traffic, um, and it, it sort of spins off. And so sometimes questions go answer, unanswered because they've already scrolled past the, you know, the window of uh, what's in your display, and um, and and people aren't going back. So. Um, I, I've actually, you know, proposed that we try and reduce the number. We got a little bit of pushback. I think we still have some discussion to go to figure out how we can, you know, improve things in that regard. And um, uh, certainly, I'm uh, trying to participate in the sort of the community health discussion around, you know, what tools can we use to improve our ability to conduct conversations that are not quite as ephemeral as you get with chat, but sometimes you want to have, uh, you know, things pu pushed out to email, for instance, uh, so that others can share in it. Um, and uh, so we're, we're looking at some of those things to try and improve some of the, the communication uh, and, and, and trying to figure out how do we, again, how do we onboard new people and how do we grow, you know, new maintainers in the community uh, over time. Um, you know, so we're, in terms of releases, we're continuing down the sort of the quarterly release cadence. Um, our 1.4 release is due out in December, um, and we're expecting that to be our first long-term support release, which we'll support for a year, backporting bug fixes um, as appropriate uh, for uh, a year while we continue to move on with, uh, you know, sort of quarterly release cadence of new features and functionality and so forth. Um, uh, that's, that's basically, that's basically it. Um, you know, again, we continue to plan uh, on our JIRA dashboard. Uh, we tried to make it a little bit clearer. There's actually now a, uh, a single JIRA dashboard that I've linked in from here that shows all of the epics that we're tracking for the next um, set of releases um, to make it a little bit easier to figure out exactly what's going on at any, any given time. But, you know, because there is so much sometimes it's just, um, it is daunting and we're trying to figure out how do we, how do we improve that? Comments, questions? Anybody there? <laughs> well, I guess I'll, I'll feel a little bit of that silence there. I noticed uh, the same tension in the the, uh, the channels that I monitor on chat, that uh, there is that tough balance that uh, more narrow channels allow for deeper discussion in specific topics. But uh, I think, I guess in, in aggregate, there's only so many messages any one person can, can track. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I got a lot of lit up stuff in my uh, rocket chat. <laughs> I just don't, I don't have the time to go back and even read. Sometimes I just clear it out um, because there's just, there's too much. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that's something we discussed in Montreal and the community health aspects that right. I, I think it's a generic problem for Hyperledger, not something each 
individual project should should need to solve on its own. Yeah, and that's why I say I'm 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 working with Tracy and Dave and and Rye on some thoughts about tools that we might use. Uh, you know, um, you know, we have Tracy did a bit of research to come up with like tools that we could use to sort of capture meetings in Rocket Chat um, and then archive that off, and then we can use it to actually put it out into an email or something like that that could then you know, uh, have a follow on conversation and email, which is a little bit easier to track than looking, you know, trying to search back in, in rocket chat history. Um, we also have the problem that none of this stuff is threaded, unfortunately, um, you know, Slack threading sucks too. Uh, maybe even, I mean, in, in some ways I think it's worse, but, um, <clears throat> Chat is hard, and I, I think, you know, Mark, to your point, generally, open source really hasn't come to grips with how chat is supposed to work for open source. Most of it is, you know, I think if you go back to the IRC days, the IRC was just a, it's just a place to hang out. It was like the water cooler, you know, and sometimes there was, you know, quick, hey, you know, where's this, mm -hmm. where's that kind of a thing. Um, uh, but for the most part, it's the water cooler, and... Um, uh, and and all conversations were held in email, and now everybody's expecting to do chat and have immediate gratification of their questions because there's chat. And I think you know, Brian, to your point, um, that it's not the greatest thing when you're going back and forth having a discussion about how something should work or whatever. Uh, maybe it's not the best. So, yeah, that's definitely a good topic for uh, community health development. Uh, thanks for the update, Chris, and. We have uh, our remaining seven or so minutes for Andy to walk us through uh, the Sawtooth update. Uh, Andrea Gunderson is joining us in this meeting for the first time as well. So uh, welcome, Andy. Hey, guys. Um, all right. So Sawtooth, um, we're doing good. Uh, we are preparing for our 1.1 release this month. Um, and there's a good list of new features that um, we've developed over the last quarter. Um, those include PBFT consensus, raft consensus, um, continuing work to, con uh, to port to Rust. Um, there's also continual work on Sabre, our smart contract in LASM, um, specifically around smart permissions, which if we have time, I'll talk about a little bit more later. Um, we also have some more documentation and support for running Sawtooth in Kubernetes, um, documentation updates. Um, and as we had mentioned, we were gonna do last update, we have split out uh, most of our SDKs, um, besides Python and Rust into their own repos. Um, also Sawtooth next directory is pretty active, which is cool. Um, as far as issues go, most of the ones we had mentioned before, um, we've given our, the updates to any of those issues, but we do have a new issue where as our community grows, um, we have dropped our sprint planning meeting and there's now no single meeting that gathers all of our maintainers together. Um, as far as releases, we were able to get our 1.0.5 bug fix release out. Um, we had mentioned that we were going to do a 1.0.6, but we've decided to cancel that in favor of focusing on our 1.1 release. Um, we also have a branch out of what our 1.1 release is going to look like, um, but that's not going to be its own release. Um, so the next release will be 1.1. Uh, the thing I want to highlight from the activity, overall activity, is we have added our Asia-friendly time slot for our application developer calls. Um, and then, yeah, current plans, getting 1.1 uh, out, which includes the consensus engine, um, multi-language consensus support, um, Raft, enhanced documentation, and a lot of that Rust conversion um, for performance enhancements, um, as well as POET2 and PBFT are still going under some work. So as those are completed, they will be a part of that as well. Um, currently working towards getting Saber, again, our WASM smart contracts, into a 1.0 state, as well as adding um, smart permissions, which I'll just give a very quick overview of what that is. Um, 
we are providing uh, usable contracts within Sabre. Um, one is going to be called the Pike, um, and that allows you to define agents and organizations and the roles that those agents are allowed to provide, um, or the roles that those agents have within organizations. And then that mixed with Sabre allows you to upload what we're calling smart permissions or WASM code to the blockchain. And then within a smart contract, you can um, provide organization specific permissioning around different functionality within the same transaction processor. Um, so I tried to go over that quickly. So if anyone has more questions about that, let me know. Um, but besides that, we're continuing to work on converting Sawtooth to Rust. Um, and then also, uh, Dan had brought up that there was interesting conversation in Montreal around um, evolutionary test nets um, to be able to identify more stability issues as well as make them more security centric. Um, maintainer diversity is good. It's uh, about equally distributed between Bitwise IO, Cargill, Intel, and T Mobile. Yeah. Any questions? Hey, Andy, just a, um, I got two for you. Um, right. One is what's the status of the Rust conversion and um, how much is actually going in the 1 1 release? Um, I believe there's conversation about this on Rocket Chat yesterday where it looks like we're about 40% conversion. Okay. Um, so if you look in specifically what was already converted, I think was mentioned in um, Sawtooth release channel on Rocket Chat. Okay, I'll go back and look at that then. Um, second question um, is, you know, okay, it's the test net question. Um, uh, this seems to come up every time we talk about um, potentials for long-term testing. Um, uh, is there a plan or is this just something we're gonna continue to discuss? So I can take that one because we had some face-to-face -face discussion in Montreal. Um, and the loose plan that we came up with there was let's get um, some starter test net going where we're, we're raising nodes in different organizations that are interested in Sawtooth. And we'll be doing just some, some of the, the basic integration testing style transactions that we do in our integration networks. Uh, but now across some different organizational boundaries. And once we learn some of the things that we'll need to do in order to scale that out uh, across additional organizations, then the idea is to get to more what uh, you had initiated a couple of years ago, Mick, with uh, the game and, and look at uh, more security focused use of a test net where we're trying to incentivize people through some sort of game to uh, uh, steal tokens or, or something of that nature. Okay. And, and again, my, you know, the, the game stuff aside, um, uh, I think we've had discussions about how to make the migration from, um, you know, things like bug bounties and others, uh, how to actually get real world testing um, of the applications. And, and so my, my real, my real underlying question is how are we evaluating um, long-term security at both application and platform level um, on on Sawtooth and others, but I think that's a bigger question than than um, than this. So you know, the test net is just one expression of that. I think for me, yeah, I think this is a good reminder for me to pick up the conversations that had started in Montreal with the the stakeholders who expressed interest and in, and in actually get uh, some of these first test nets launched. Now, there had been a um, discussion on the mailing list a month or two back about test nets in general at the Hyperledger level, not just at each project level. Is, is that something we're still going to pursue, or is it going to be up to each project to come up with their own test net? Can I jump in here? Um, this is Dave Hughesby. Um, so we're putting together the budget for 2019, and I was actually just queuing up emails to send out to people to ask about this because I'm going to try to come up with some numbers around what we were willing to spend on doing test nets um, because I keep hearing it from a lot of people. So um, yeah, I was considering putting it in the, in the budget and making that a thing next year. So Dan, can we queue up the discussion for next TSC? 
that sounds like a great topic. Uh, and that does also bring us to the end of the time. So we'll, uh, we'll look at that and a few other topics for next week. Thank you for everybody for joining. Thanks, Hal. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>